Hello and welcome. This is Matthias 76, and together we are decoding the deception. Together we are going deep in the Word of God. And we are picking up today with Daniel, the second chapter, the 24th verse, where he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You can find, I've got here on the screen, I've got here on the screen our website, and you can find all our Daniel videos right here. You just go up to Bible videos, click on Daniel, but I want to show you what else we have here. If you scroll down, we've got these resources. We've got these timelines. We've got maps, other things, and we'll be adding to this as there are more things that we find that would be helpful in, in studying the book of Daniel. And with these, just a, a word of advice, if you right-click on them, and open in a new tab, then they get bigger and you can zoom around on them, zoom in and, and scroll around, but it can be very helpful just to keep your bearings because we're not used to, we are not familiar with, for good reason, the world that existed 2,700 years ago. That's what we're talking about, 2,700 years ago, back when the Roman Empire had not really been born yet. So we're going, we're going way back in time. So it's, it's helpful to have resources to make things um, more familiar and easy for you to, to find your way around and keep up with everything. I just need to close some panels here before my computer starts to tell me that I'm using way too many resources. I end up with so many things open. Okay, so here we are. We're jumping in to Daniel 2, 24. And, and just refresher, go back and listen to the last video. It is important. But Nebuchadnezzar, that the coolest name in the Bible, that guy, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It was very troubling, and he made absurd demands of the wise men, the magi, the, the sorcerers, all those guys, the collective. He brought them all together, and he made an absurd demand that they not only interpret the dream, but that they tell him what the dream was first. And it's, on one level, it's absurd. No one had ever done that. It was tyrannical. On the other hand, it's kind of smart. It's kind of smart. If, if you've got the divine connections to tell me the meaning of this dream, because he knew it was significant. He knew it mattered and it freaked him out. If you've got the divine connections to tell me the meaning of the dream, then you ought to have the divine connections to tell me what the dream was. As I taught last week, tyrants aren't stupid. Most tyrants are pretty daggone smart. Stalin, smart. Nebuchadnezzar, smart. That's how they get where they end up. It almost seems like he was kind of questioning his beliefs and like the people around him that he trusted. I think you're on to something there because what happened? He was shaken. He was shaken. He was afraid. And when do you think that's I'm gl so glad you brought that up. When do you think the last time was that Nebuchadnezzar, that guy, was afraid? Really afraid. I'm not sure. I don't think they had any big opponent. <laughs> well, yeah. And plus, he had always won. He had always won. And, and, and everybody out there, and, and I tend to go to the guys, but everybody, girls as well, you knew somebody in sports who always won. Were they ever intimidated? D d were they ever overwhelmed by the way the other team appeared? No. They didn't scare them. The guy who always wins isn't afraid of anyone. So he'd never been afraid. It was his first time. Like, oh, sorry, uh, bear with me. I'm new to this. I'm terrified. Interesting thought. I'm glad you brought that up. 
And, and that explains his actions. He was going the extra mile to make sure he didn't get duped. But Daniel had at, gone into the king. How exactly that went down, we don't know. Because you didn't just walk in and say, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, I got an idea. You didn't do that. There was protocol. OK, protocol that made what goes on to get into the White House or the palace over in London look like nothing. But he got in, told him, give me time. I'll tell you the interpretation of the dream, went back to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and asked them to pray, went to bed. God revealed it to him. And, and where we ended was his his praising God for being who he is, and how awesome he is. So this is where we pick up. Therefore, Daniel went in to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, And said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. We'll stop there. Politicians are always politicians. They just are. When you exist in a very political environment, and you can can exist in that at work, right? There's all kinds of politics that go on at work and you'll pass something off to someone and say, Hey, I I came up with this as a way to deal with whatever, or here's this analysis I've done of this and And what do they do? Oftentimes it's not uncommon. They'll present it higher up the chain as their idea, or they'll just say, here, we've got this. They take credit. Arioch is, Arioch didn't go find anybody. Daniel came to him and was insistent, but politicians are always politicians, but make note of this because what we see in Daniel, completely different. 26, the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, his name was changed as well, but it very rarely refers to him as Belteshazzar. When you get taken over, when you get taken into captivity, they get to hang a new collar around your neck with a tag that says, if lost, call this number, right? You belong to them. That's the point of renaming someone. Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? I I keep doing this because it is so vital to getting the setting. Everyone was afraid of this guy. Everyone. One wrong word and you could be done. He'd just wink or wave to Arioch and Arioch could cut off your head right there in front of him. That's who this guy was. That's the setting that's here. So you came in here, you dared enter here, It's like uh, Aladdin, who dares disturb my slumber in the cave of wonders? You came in here, you better have a good answer. You better be ready to go. Daniel answered the king and said, no. (laughs) He says more than that, but faith is fearless. Stop and think about that. As you deal with whatever in life, faith is fearless. I'm not saying we're always faith, that we're always fearless, even though we have faith, but to the degree that we allow fear to control us, direct us, influence us, it's pushing faith out of the way to do it. No wise man. Enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. The last guys who said that to him, it didn't go so well. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be 
in the latter days. Those astrologers, wise men, sorcerers, they had set the stage with saying nobody can do this. Daniel emphasizes it again. No one can do this, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. What is he saying? The God I serve is above all other gods. There's only one who can do this. There's only one. And it's Yahweh. And what's the dream? He's made known to you what will happen. And no doubt, that is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar was afraid of. He knew this dream was bad. He knew it was bad news. He he just didn't know how to decipher it. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these to you, O king. As you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. That's what kings stay up at night worrying about, thinking about, contemplating. Where's this going? What's happening? What are the threats? What are the internal threats? What are the external threats? What all do I need to be keeping my eye on? Can I trust my advisors? Can I not trust my advisors? I can't be everywhere. Are they telling me the truth? Is someone organizing a coup? And we see that stuff in the book of Daniel later on with Nebuchadnezzar's son, the successor. But as for me, and he's not telling him yet what it is, because he's still got to praise God. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. This guy was holding the brass ring. He had it. He had it. What Nebuchadnezzar would give his right arm and half his kingdom to find out Daniel knew, but before he goes and says it, before he spurts it out, puts it out there, he makes sure to praise God and says, this isn't a me thing. What does that teach us? What does that teach us about faithfulness? What does that teach us about honoring our God? What does it teach us about humility? It's not about me. Man, if I could remember that all the time, I would be such a better servant. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's all about him. Give glory to him. And that's exactly what Daniel does, because he's done all this talking here from up here where the yellow begins down here to the end of the blue. And he hasn't told him what it is yet. He had to make sure he understood that he understood this is a God thing. It's not a Daniel thing. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image, this image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. So over here on the right, let's see if we can pop this baby open. This is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar. It might be Daniel when he's getting the vision of what the dream is, but there is the statue. There is the statue, and that's a pretty good representation, except I think it's lacking in one way that we'll discuss. Its appearance was frightening. Does that statue look frightening? I don't know. I, it doesn't strike me as frightening. But this is just an artist's rendering of the statue. But I'm thinking maybe the face was a little bit more intimidating looking. I, I don't know. The head of this image was a fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron 
the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So much here. So much here. What he is doing, what God showed Nebuchadnezzar in this dream, is the next, let's go six, seven, eight, nine hundred years, thousand years of history of the ruling empires and powers of the world. And this is important. It says its appearance was frightening. And, and, you know, the artists do the best they can with with giving their rendition of of what these beasts looked like or what the statue looked like. This is the beast from the sea in the book of Revelation. Here I'll put on the screen later in Daniel 7. We've got these four beasts appearing, and they terrified Daniel, and that was a vision Daniel had. Now, with the other, with this, the statue, we've got the head of gold, and then he's told that another kingdom after you will come that is inferior to you. That's the, the medio, medi. Media, the Medes and the Persians, the Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians, they came after Daniel. That's, um, man, my brain is really struggling this morning. Darius, Cyrus the Great, those guys who ruled that empire. Then after that, the legs of the, the thighs and that of, of bronze is Greece. Alexander the Great, who also gets pictured, he gets pictured three ways in, in the book of Daniel. One of them's a goat. And then the legs of iron, but feet with iron mixed with clay, and that's kind of hard to figure out, iron mixed with clay, that is, that is Rome. But this image here, it, the, the vision he has in Daniel 7, same empires. Same empires. This is Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the bear with ribs in its mouth. This is the, the, the I think I'm getting it right, might, might have it wrong. The, the lion is the Persians. I know for sure the uh, four headed leopard with wings, that's Greece. Greece, Alexander the Great, when he died at an early age, his kingdom was divided between his four generals, the Ptolemies, four-headed empire of the Greeks, and then a great and terrible beast with 10 horns on its head. That is the Roman Empire. Now, when it comes to these empires, it's important to understand, and this all feeds right into Revelation, Revelation 13, which my last two videos on Revelation were on, and I keep saying I'm going to get the next one out, but I keep finding more things to study and, and work on. But Rome was at a different level when it came to being terrifying. And all of these, make no mistake, there is imagery in the scriptures consistent throughout that makes it clear these empires are not nice. They're scary. They are tyrannical. They are oppressive. All of them. All of them. The Romans get pictured the way they do. Iron is the strongest of all these metals. Not as fancy, for sure, but iron is incredibly strong. We'll get to the feet mixed with clay. But Rome took everything to a new level with organization, with covering such a vast. When you look at the Roman Empire at its zenith, they had all of North Africa. They had the, the, the Middle East there around the Mediterranean. They had all the way around, all the way up into Europe. And 
even into, into Great Britain for a time. Now, they never conquered the Germans. They never really conquered Great Britain, which wasn't Great Britain then. But they were fierce. They, they, they were quite, quite terrible. So, consistent theme in the scriptures. Empires are scary. They're never nice. Show me a nice empire, and I'll tell you why you're wrong. They're not nice. The British Empire, <laughs> not nice at all. They may have been very polite and, 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 and loved their tea. They weren't nice. No empire is nice. They put their foot on someone else's neck so they can take their stuff and do what they want with it and serve their own nation and serve the leaders more than anything else. Same thing with the empire in which you live here in these United States. We just do it on the down low. We fool everybody, but we put our foot on other people's necks and we take their stuff. It's what we do. And that's why they have no qualms about turning around and oppressing you. Vaccine mandates, all of this stuff going on right now. All we're doing is getting a dose of what the United States of America, which is part of the Roman Empire that never went away. Listen to my last revelation video. The United States of America has been doing to everybody else for a heck of a long time. The Roman Empire, feet of clay and iron, the, the way things were mixed with so many different cultures eventually was its undoing. Its strength, covering such a vast territory and organizing it so well, but still it was all mixed and you had all these factions. I want to say this because I don't want to forget. Bible scholars, so-called Bible scholars, not all of them, but there are Bible scholars who will say that this book wasn't written until after most of this had gone down. That's how it could be so accurate in portraying these different kingdoms. That's what they say. When you do that, you take God and you make him into nothing because the impressive thing about this is it's foretold beforehand. That's a God thing. He does it all the time. If you take the miraculous out of the Bible, you've got myth. You've got stories. You've got stuff that was fabricated. Either you believe it or you don't. Very important. Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel were told this stuff in advance, and Daniel's going to see more things in advance because it served the kingdom, and we're going to get to that right now. Enough yakking about kings and empires and tyrants for the moment. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. It's just a little stone compared to that big, tall, intimidating scary statue that represented empires, right? And they do kind of cannibalize each other, don't they? Kind of interesting. One little stone isn't impressive. It's not. And, and if you want to learn about something that's not impressive, but is very important, go read Isaiah 53 and how it prophetically telling the future in advance, just like Daniel is doing here, how it describes Jesus. He wasn't good looking. He wasn't anything special. He, he, there was nothing in his appearance that made anybody say, ooh, wow, this guy's something else. And then go read one of the Gospels. We're going through Matthew right now. Go read one of the Gospels and see how impressive any of that looks. Look at the nation of Israel and Judah, even at their height of power, even with Solomon as the king. The, the pinnacle of the United Kingdom, it was stinky. Filthy rich, amazingly admired, looked up to by everyone. It was dinky. It wasn't anything impressive by the world's standards. It didn't come close to Egypt. It didn't come close to Babylon, to Persia, to Assyria, to the Hittites. Take your pick. 
God doesn't use things that to the world are impressive because it's by faith. It's by faith. If God wins people over by just being impressive, they're not being won over by the right thing. They're being impressed, not saved. Daniel, the way he dealt with all of this, it wasn't about him. It was about his God. Humble. Faith is a humble thing. God operates, for the most part, in a humble manner. Jesus, with all his miracles, did he want that to be what he was about? What would he tell people? Don't tell anybody. He was helping them because they were hurt and he couldn't help but help them. He, he healed people who weren't believers. It didn't matter. He felt bad for them, but that's not what he was about. Don't, don't tell everybody. And when he got to be too popular, what did he do? He went off in the sticks. This stone is not impressive. It's not. But that stone was going to bring down the greatest empire ever, that being the Roman Empire. And, and with that, really, all Rome had done had sucked up all the other empires into it. And that really is a good way of viewing the way the Roman Empire worked. But let's look at some Bible verses just to, to put this breaking them in pieces into perspective. Matthew 21, 44, talking about the stone that God has laid a cornerstone. And he who falls on that stone will be broken into pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. That stone that the builders rejected. Luke 20, 18, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Just Luke's take on the same thing. But here, Psalm 2, 8 through 12, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. This is God the Father talking to his son. And the ends of the earth, your possession, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord, Yahweh, with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So that is talking about the one who is going to come, that little stone who is going to crush those empires, and they were going to come to nothing. Then the iron and the clay and the silver and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. We don't have threshing floors. We used to have threshing machines. Now, and they were drawn by horses or steam-powered tractors, which are really a trip if you've ever seen one of those things. Now we have something called a combine. It combines several things together into one. There, a little farming lesson. That's why they call it a, a combine. But behind the combine, when it's chopping corn, gathering the corn, at the back, it's spewing out all the dusty stuff. With wheat, it does the same thing. All the chaff goes out the back. Back in the day, they had a, a stone floor. They bring the wheat and they take these big forks and throw the wheat up into the air. And the husks, the chaff that you didn't want, you wanted the kernel, would blow away in the breeze. So that was a picture. All of these people understood. We'd say it's like the stuff coming out the back of a combine that just blows away and nobody wants it. It gets plowed back into the earth. Like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. Chaff is nothing. It's, it, it's carried off. Those who think, and apply this to today, those who think that they rule the nations, and it can be said they do, those who think that they are in power, especially those who think they answer to no one do answer, and they will answer, and it will be an eternal 
answering, reckoning. Psalm 1, 4. The wicked are not so. And this is Psalm 1 where it talks about the righteous and the wicked, that the righteous flourish and grow like a tree planted next to water. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Isaiah 17, 13, and 14, the nations roar like the roaring of many waters. They do, don't they? Don't you cross us. Don't you stand up to me. Don't you dare cross me. Rome showed that. Carthage stood up to Rome one too many times. And then they they laid waste. They plowed salt into the earth so that nothing would grow there anymore as an example. It's the same, very similar to what they did to Jerusalem in 69 and 70 AD. Jerusalem rebelled one too many times, and the general Titus, who later became the emperor, went there and laid waste to the city, and they killed everyone, and they crushed everything, and they tore down the temple. All that's left is the wall. It's called the Wailing Wall. They laid waste to everything and they killed everyone. And the lesson was clear. Don't you dare stand up to us. The nations will roar like the roaring of many waters. But he, the Lord, will rebuke them and they will flee far away. Chased like the chaff on the mountains before the wind and whirling dust before the storm at evening time. Behold, terror. Evening, Nebuchadnezzar, when did he have his dream? Terror. Before the day, before the morning, they are no more. And we'll see that later with his son, killed overnight. This is the portion of those who loot us and the lot of those who plunder us. They may loot us. They may plunder us, and they do. But... Their end is sure and certain, and it's not pleasant. Isaiah 41, 15, behold, I make you a threshing threshing sledge. That's kind of a tough one. Threshing sledge. New, sharp, and having teeth, you shall thresh the mountains and crush them, and you shall make the hills like chaff. Isaiah 41, that's talking about Jesus. Pretty much anything. Isaiah 40 through 66 It's like there are two part books of Isaiah, 1 through 39, and then 40 through 66. 40 through 66, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This is a prophetic ministry saying he's going to do exactly what's pictured here with the stone smashing that statue, smashing those empires, and they all blow away. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. One reference we'll look at there, Isaiah 2.2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. From the Roman Empire on, empires have tried to undo Christianity. Sometimes they've tried to undo it by perverting it, but it grows and it grows and it grows and they can't stop it. And eventually, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Are you guys able to see everything on my screen? Okay, because I just had a thing pop up that said, now participants can see your screen. So that's at 40 minutes. I'll have to edit that out. Verse 36, this was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. And and I just want to say, there's so much more I could say about all that. So much of scripture is dedicated to the assurance given to the kingdom, that's you and me, that's never impressive. Jesus. Nobody was impressed except the faithful. The 12 disciples, nobody was impressed. That ragtag lot of nobodies being sent out to preach to the whole known world at the time, no one was impressed. They tried to squash it. Satan tried to squash it. It just keeps growing and going and nothing can stop it. The God whom you serve is greater than them all. Never forget that. When, when those who would intimidate you, when situations that would intimidate you, when events that would intimidate you confront you, 
hold on to faith because it displaces fear. There's no place for fear where there is faith. This was the dream, verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. Did you catch something? In that sentence, I've got it highlighted <clears throat> in purple. We, we, <laughs> he's so humble, he brought his friends along. The dream wasn't revealed to them. They prayed. He prayed. He went to bed. God revealed it to him. But it's just kind of cool. He, he's so disinterested, disinclined to receive glory. He brings his friends with him because they prayed for it too. But it can it, it could escape you. We. This was the dream. Now we shall tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, Media, Persia. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, Greece, which shall rule over all the earth. His, his, Alexander the Great's empire was pretty impressive. And there shall be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, that being Rome, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. But here's what they say. Seed of men, yeah. But they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven, what well, we'll stop before we get to 44. So I had kind of in advance talked about the interpretation of the dream, that they're all going to go. They're all going to be brought down. But who the kingdoms are and kind of the characteristics of those kingdoms, especially the Roman Empire. And, and I'll say this, with the thing about mixed with iron, mixed with clay, you, you, can, you can look at the fact that the Roman Empire ended up toward the end. It was a divided kingdom. You had Constantinople and you had Rome and there were civil wars they had where the empire was split that way. There was a lot of intrigue with that. I'm going to go ahead and go here. In the book of Revelation, it says that Rome has a wound that's healed and it lives on, that there are three horns that in the end, three horns representing kings, that go together. It is my belief that the Roman Empire, and it isn't just my belief, but I do believe that the Roman Empire still exists. And I'll throw this out there. And, and when I can't think of the exact video right now, I'll pop the, the thumbnail on the screen and put the link below because I did a video on this in the book of, in the book of Revelation. Rome never went away. How do I say that? Go look at Washington, D.C. Go look at the Vatican and go look at the city of London. There are, and most people don't know this, there are three city states, three city states. The Vatican is a state. It is a nation unto itself. A lot of people know that. There is a one mile square area 
in downtown London called the City of London, not London, the City of London. That's where all the bankers live and operate. And it is a city state. It is not a part of Great Britain. And shocker, Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia is a city state. Yeah, that one takes takes some getting used to. But that beast of Rome that didn't go away. And what do all the architecture in these places look like? They look like Rome. There's some really intriguing stuff with all that. And just for example, with, well, that's pictured here. We'll pop this up. It talks about the horns, three horns giving away to one big horn. Right there. Not little big horn, but one big horn. I will put the thumbnail for that video up there, but it really works to do Revelation and Daniel at the same time because many of the same things are talked about. Much of the same imagery. The beasts are talked about again. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. This kingdom is different. That little stone that grows into a whole mountain, a stone not cut out by human hands. This isn't Nebuchadnezzar's doing. This isn't Darius's doing. This isn't Pharaoh's doing. It's a God thing. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. This vision that he had, this thing that he saw, this statue and what it represents was not just about what was going to go on with the nations for a relatively short period of time. It takes it all the way to the end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. One more thing I thought of in in supporting the position that the Roman Empire didn't really go away. It just kind of went underground. What was the point I was going to make? I said that, and then I, oh, why is the last beast that's talked about Rome? Why is the last beast that's talked about in all of prophetic history, prophetic history, that's interesting, in all of prophecy, apocalyptic prophecy in the Old and New Testaments, Rome, because it doesn't go away. That's why. So he interprets the dream for him, all kinds of stuff there. And as you can tell, by the way, I've kind of jumped around and gotten very intense. There's so much here to be considered. So much insight into the working of our world and how it really operates. There's just so much. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering of incense be offered up to him. He's worshiping like a god. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. And a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. There are different times, and it happens here in Daniel, where kings will say, everybody needs to honor the God of Daniel and others. Doesn't mean they believe. He's just impressed. There isn't ever anything <laughs> that, that makes us inclined to think that Nebuchadnezzar became a believer in the one true God. He's just impressed. He's just impressed. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over the wise men of Babylon. That's pretty high elevation. Similar to what happened to the very faithful man, Joseph, so also Daniel is put in a position of supreme power. But Daniel, being Daniel, 
Joseph didn't have anybody to ask to be elevated with him. Daniel does. This guy's just a class act. Any way you look at it, any way you consider it, Daniel is an amazing guy. He's an amazing prophet. He's amazingly faithful. And he's a good friend. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained in the king's court. He asked, I mean, it is so impressive. He asked to have his friends elevated in position as well. It's just, so it says so much about his character that at that moment, while he's receiving all this adulation, all these gifts, when it says that Nebuchadnezzar gave great gifts, what do you think that might have included? What do you think that entailed? I don't know, but I'm thinking it was probably pretty impressive. He could give some pretty great, some pretty great gifts, but he's elevated to this position of power. And don't forget, whenever we think about the influence that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but especially Daniel, had over the kingdom of Babylon and, and that he was chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon, you need to take that right to Matthew 2. Why did those guys know? Why were they looking? Why did they come? Why did they make that lengthy sojourn? Why were they believers? Because they were. The Magi were believers. And you, there is no logical explanation for it other than it was the working of Daniel. Pretty impressive. He went into a horrible situation where, by all human standards and expectations, there wasn't much hope that he could remain faithful. He did remain faithful. He did so with great courage. He was quite resolute. And he ends up being in this amazing, awesome position of power. But Nebuchadnezzar is not done. Nebuchadnezzar is not done. He's still got to build his golden image. We'll get to that. We'll get to that next time. But I hope you see There are portions of scripture that get, I'm going to make up a really awkward term here, Sunday schoolified. Sunday schoolified. That's what would happen if I was a doctor of theology. There would be used, words used and phrases used like Sunday schoolified. But these stories get Sunday schoolified where we just think of them as things to teach the little kids and teach them to sing Brave Daniel in the Lion's Den in Sunday school. This stuff is vitally important. You can't understand the book of Revelation without this stuff. This is the main apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic meaning pointing to the end. It is the main prophecies about the end times in the Old Testament, even here in the story about the statue. It's pointing ahead to all that. It's painting a picture. It is teaching through a picture. Very important stuff. Very important stuff. And, and, and we could have gone on for a lot longer, but I keep this to an hour and I run out of voice and I'm not able to, to do anything after a while. We are going to stop there. I do encourage you, go out here to the Daniel page on our website. Check out. You can find our videos there. This one will be there tomorrow. But all our videos are there, and we've got the resources. Make use of that. I hope that you found this beneficial, and I know that you are. There are people who are giving feedback, and that means so much. There are people giving feedback in the comments. There are people reaching out through the website. All you have to do is go up here to contact us, and you can shoot me a message or ask me a question. I will get to you and answer those within a day most times. But it lets us know you're out there, and that does matter. I'm talking into a can here, and, and I don't know where it goes. So when you give feedback, 
it, it really means something. If you found this video beneficial, then please smash that like button. And I also invite you to subscribe. And when you subscribe, make sure and hit that notification bell so you're made aware when we put out new content. Share this video with others. Put it on your social media feed. People are doing that. We're getting hits on the website from Facebook, Twitter, all kinds of places where I don't put this stuff because I don't have time. And we now have visits to our website from 59 countries and six continents. So you guys are doing an awesome job in sharing this. Please continue to do so and do drop by and pay us a visit. If you know our name, you know how to find us, decodingthedeception.com. This is Matthias76. Together, we are decoding the deception. Together, we're going deep in the word of God. God bless and have a great day.